Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia. Jimmy, welcome to Econ Talk. Uh, very good, thank you. What was the original conception of Wikipedia? How did it get started? Well, the original concept of Wikipedia um, was actually uh, it, it came about in 1999 when I first had the idea of a free encyclopedia uh, written by thousands of volunteers in all the languages of the world and founded a project called Newpedia, um, which was the first um, effort, which was uh, ultimately not successful. Uh, And Newpedia was a very uh, top-down project with a very uh, complex uh, review system. Uh, People actually had to make an application to be allowed to write an article on a particular subject, and they had to prove that they were qualified and so forth. And that was a failure uh, primarily because it wasn't much fun um, for the volunteers. It was uh, quite an intimidating process. So uh, in uh, 2001 um, was the the launch of Wikipedia, which, of course, uh, is a very open system, very different from the original concept. And, um, uh, well, we got more work done in two weeks than we had gotten done in nearly two years. So it was pretty exciting. And what was the leap of faith that got you to think about trying uh, a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach? Well, I I have been complaining for quite some time about the top-down approach and that it wasn't uh, didn't seem to be working very well and it was costing a lot of money and uh, progress was very slow. Um, I really realized it wasn't going to work when I personally um, tried to write an article for Newpedia. I had been an academic in finance, um, working on a PhD uh, in finance, and I had published a paper on option pricing theory, so I thought I could write an entry about Robert Merton, who um, had recently won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in option pricing theory, um, and just found myself with a complete writer's block. It was very intimidating. Um, And so I said, well, this is just really never going to be successful, uh, considering how uh, you know, difficult this this is. Uh, so, you know, when I first put the installed the software and opened up the site, I thought, uh, gee, you know, this um, uh, this site, uh, you know, it's very very open now. We're going to try to keep it as open as possible for as long as possible. But I had assumed at the time that we would be, uh, you know, forced to lock everything down within a week or two. Um, you know, I figured well. We have a small community now, and, and as long as nobody knows about it, we can leave this open and, and play with it, and then we'll figure out what to do. But I made the decision, um, you know, to, to try to keep it open, and of course, it's still very, very open even today. Now, you have said that the work of Hayek influenced the development of Wikipedia, which is uh, pretty exciting. There aren't many extraordinary projects in the world that uh, are influenced by Hayek, and I'd be curious to know how that came about, and um, to what extent it's true. Well, so what's interesting, um, I originally read um, Hayek's essay um, from American Economic Review, 1945, uh, The Use of Knowledge in Society, uh, many, many years ago, uh, back, actually, I think I was an undergraduate at the time, and it really uh, had, had quite a deep impact on my thinking about lots of things. Um, and I think uh, a lot, uh, you know, in a, a game theoretic kind of way about um, rulemaking, um, you know, within society, um, uh, you know, how people interact. Um, and some of the basic ideas are, are just, you know, as simple as, you know, noticing that um, simply making a rule against something doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It it just changes the cost benefits and uh, so on and so forth. So, um, in terms of uh, the Hayek connection, I think what's interesting about that essay 
Um, you know, at the time, uh, the, the, there was an ongoing debate uh, in economics as to the uh, efficacy of a centrally planned economy versus the efficacy of, uh, uh, of a market economy. And Hayek's point uh, in that essay was that really, in, in many ways, this is a question of information flow. Uh, in other words, is it more effective to communicate all the decision-making, uh, I'm sorry, communicate all of the information inward to a central decision-making authority who will then um, use that information to make an appropriate decision, or is it more efficient to uh, leave the information where it is and push decision-making out to the end point? So, you know, if we're thinking about how are we going to decide how much bread to make, um, you know, do we communicate market conditions inward to a central government uh, official who surveys the entire state of the industry and so on and makes decisions, um, or do we leave it up to the individual businesses to decide how much bread they're going to make? Well, the, the parallel here for me is that um, with the encyclopedia, the, there's the same kind of question. Is it better to gather all the world's information and have it sent into a group of experts who then make editorial decisions, or is it better to push the decision-making out to the endpoints, out to the people who actually have the information? And so that's really the, the analogy uh, that has really influenced my thinking about how Wikipedia functions and how it ought to function uh, in order to, uh, you know, be uh, good. And that analogy came before the fact, not after the fact? Um, I think uh, I think that analogy came after the fact, I would say. Of, uh, but it's, it's more about understanding what works and doesn't work in Wikipedia and why. So I think, uh, you know, it's been influential in... By thinking about, uh, well, lots and lots of things. I mean, there are many, many possible uh, things that have been put forward over time with respect to Wikipedia, uh, proposals that people make. And one of the first things I always look at is, you know, is this an effort to centralize something that can be left decentralized? Um, because the, the, the real problem with centralizing is that you now have a, a bottleneck, a single point of failure, um, and that's really uh, not good for the design. So how much centralization is there in Wikipedia right now? Uh, anybody can edit it, but what role, yes. what role is there in terms of infrastructure, if any, to oversee the whole process? Well, there, it's all community-driven, so it's a very open-ended community. Um, and with, from within the community, there are people who are elected by the community to be administrators, uh, then... Uh, People can also be elected to the arbitration committee. Um, in theory, you don't need to be an administrator to be elected to the arbitration committee, but that's never happened and it seems extremely unlikely that someone who's not an admin uh, would, would make it onto the arbitration committee. Um, and, uh, and then I have a role uh, you know, in that whole process in terms of um, making certain decisions about when we have elections, and um, I actually make the final appointments to the arbitration committee although traditionally I do it by following the vote of the community. What role does the arbitration uh, committee play? Well, the, the primary thing that the arbitration committee uh, does is deal with disputes uh, that people have been unable to resolve in any of the other uh, ways that we have for resolving disputes. Um, and there's a whole dispute resolution process at Wikipedia, and uh, really the arbitration committee is... is Basically, the last uh, stop, uh, you know, on, in that in that process. So they hear cases. Um, um, really, uh, it's, it's actually in, in a certain way they, they hear cases uh, in a uh, similar way to the Supreme Court. Um, and what I mean by that is, there, well, there are no lower courts, but there are many other dispute resolution processes, and the arbitration committee is very aware of. The, the the importance of precedent. They can set a precedent. Um, they can, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in their in their findings in a particular case, they can put forth a principle that people will then point to in the future and say, well, we we don't need to go all the way to the arbitration committee because we know they've said this and this is sort of the way we should do things. And how big is it? The arbitration committee is about. 
Um, I think there are a total of 15 people on the committee, but it, it's all volunteers, so sometimes people are away for a couple of weeks or whatever, but we, we normally run with uh, um, probably 9 to 11 um, are, are reasonably active. And how many administrators are there? Uh, in the English Wikipedia, there are, I, I actually don't know the number, there's a, around 1,000 active administrators. Um, in terms of the, the number of uh, administrators, it's probably um, two, two or 3,000 by now, uh, in, in just in English alone. Um, no, here we go, uh, 1,622 administrators in the English Wikipedia. But, of course, some, some of them are not particularly active. Sure. Um, so. When you started it, did you have any um, knowledge of the history of the Oxford English Dictionary? You know, I did not. I did not. And, in fact, I read the, the, the famous book about it, um, The Professor and the Madman, only uh, really several years later uh, some, someone said that, that you have to read this, you must read this book. <laughs> I it's actually pretty, had no idea. It's a pretty entertaining um, book. Yeah, it's a good book. It's very, very uh, intriguing. And it is the probably the one of the first examples that we know about of where what we now call crowdsourcing, where uh, thousands of unknown individuals, unknown to each other, contributed the dispersed Hayekian knowledge to a large project. Yeah, no, that's right. It's uh, it's really a it's pretty unusual, and a, and a lot of our um, a lot of our governance structures. Um, really evolved um, over over time, um, and in fact, a lot of our policy, um, you know, w- what what ends up happening is rather than policy being prescriptive, written policy, it's actually descriptive. Somebody will go and change the policy page when they notice that um, what is documented there is not what's actually being done, um, and some sometimes things are are um, uh, just happen over time. And um, you know our, our whole system of government is is evolved um, for lots and lots of historical reasons, um, and we're not we've never been too concerned about um, attempting any kind of radical rationalization of it. So it's actually funny. I think um, Americans have a harder time getting it than uh, than the British because uh, we Americans we like to think of we're always looking for where is the Constitution and. Uh, in in you know in British law, it's, uh, there's tons and tons of things that have gone into the law over many many centuries, and lots of customs and traditions that aren't actually written down anywhere that are sort of interesting. Well, that's also very Hayekian. He made the distinction between law and legislation, and exactly. su- suggested that judges' job isn't to figure out what the law is and decree it, but rather should discover what norms and customs have evolved, and that should be how they rule. And that yes. is that is more That's British. Right. Uh, what's been the biggest challenge of the whole experience? Um, you know, it's been it's it's been a good ride. So, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that question. Really, um, you know, uh, for the organization, uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is always fundraising, um, and um, we've never had any really serious problems with fundraising. But it's something that we have to take very seriously because we have to. Uh, keep the, uh, you know, keep the thing, uh, keep the thing running, which requires some money uh, to keep the servers on on the air and things like that. So that's a that's a challenge. And then, of course, uh, within the community, there's always something going on, but I, I don't see anything that's you know a particular standout challenge. Let's talk about the costs, the out-of-pocket costs, for a minute. How many people are using Wikipedia at a point in time? Well, in in any given month, we see about 280 million people visiting the site. So that's according to ComScore's numbers, and those uh, reasonably accurately reflect what we see in our own logs. So 280 million people a month are using the site, and yet we have a staff now of only 25 people, um, and everybody else, including me, is all volunteers, which is a pretty remarkable thing. So most of the cost is broadband. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's, there's the cost of the staff, there's the cost of the bandwidth, yeah, um, I mean. and the cost of new servers, uh, things like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the bulk of the, the bulk of the costs traditionally have been, uh, technology related costs of, of various kinds. And is the rate of material that's accumulating on the sites 
growing at an increasing pace, a slowing pace? Um, I think it's growing at a slowing pace, um, at least in English. Um, the, Once we figured in, everything out. Pardon? We figured yeah, everything right, exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes people ask me, how many articles do I think Wikipedia will eventually have? And I always laugh and refuse to answer the question because I'm sure given enough time, my answer will sound funny. Yeah. Um, you know, but, yeah, I mean, we're at 2.7 million entries in English, and the nature of a Wikipedia entry is such that um, <clears throat> there is a limit uh, to, to how many entries that we can possibly have. Uh, they're not, you know, the titles are very consistent. Uh, we're not going to have 35 different entries on uh, Colin Powell. We're going to have one. And, um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of other elements to that. There's always something new going on in the world, and, and we still find, I mean, it's actually very interesting. Um, if you if you look in Wikipedia, and I haven't checked this recently, but I'm, I'm almost certain it's still true, uh, we don't have an article on every single member of parliament of India. So that's, uh, that's a very large parliament. I think around 600 people are in parliament in India. Um, well, that seems like we should be able to have an entry about every member of parliament in India, but we currently don't. And that's just an example um, of something that I know of that, that we um, wish we had and we don't. So... Um, well, I, I think there's still a long way to go, um, actually. Do the articles get longer? They do. They do. Over time, um, articles get longer to a certain point. Uh, there is a certain um, feeling in the community that articles shouldn't be um, really much, 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 you know, like way too long because they become unusable um, in, in that sense. And what we prefer to do, if an article is beginning to get uh, to what we would subjectively deem as too long, we start looking at ways to break parts of it out. Um, so, for example, if you look at, um, you know, China, um, well, there's the main article on China, which is several pages long, but then um, there will be many uh, side articles like uh, the economy of China, human rights in China, the demographics of China, things like that. So there's always, um, you know, uh, ways of, of splitting things out. But in general, uh, the entries do get longer over time. And do the, are the insiders, the administrators, making those decisions about cutting them off at a certain point? Uh, yeah, although there's nothing about that process of deciding whether we should uh, move something out into a separate article that is really requires administrators to do. Um, anyone can do it. Anyone can um, make that argument and, and you know create create a new article and move some of the things over to that. Um, article. So, um, well, yeah, uh, but it's mostly administrators. Now, talk a little bit about the cultural impact of Wikipedia, at least as perceived by by you as uh, founder. Uh, my my daughter, who is sixteen, wants uh, to know if it's okay to use Wikipedia for her history uh, research paper, and she uh-huh. wants and she wants your answer. Um, but, of course, your answer is one answer, and there's many diverse answers across high schools, colleges, universities, academic community generally. What do you think mm-hmm. is what do you think has happened to the reliability of Wikipedia as a source, not the reliability, the acceptability of Wikipedia as a source, and is it changing? Um, so yeah, I think it is changing to some extent, and um, what's interesting is uh, whenever I'm asked, I say I don't think people should use Wikipedia as a, uh, a cited source um, in general. Now, um, I, mean, I can go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, I would say when I was in uh, college, if I were to use um, Wikipedia as uh, a source and cite it in a paper, I'm sorry, not Wikipedia didn't exist when I was in college, um, but uh, Britannica. If I were to use Britannica as a source, that would have been considered unacceptable. That's just not what you do in a university level paper. Um, you, you, you know, that's, um, you, it's not the right rule for an encyclopedia in the research process. You can use the encyclopedia as broad background to get you started, get you oriented, but you really should be going to the uh, to the references, you should be going to the original materials and reading that and writing your paper based on that. I think that's generally true, and that's a, that's a separate issue from the reliability of Wikipedia. I would still think that's true 
uh, even if Wikipedia is uh, completely um, accurate um, or as accurate as, as we might think an encyclopedia could be, um, we would still say, um, gee, well, that's not really what you're supposed to do with uh, an encyclopedia. Uh, at the same time, you know, when we, when we go down to younger students, and I, I don't have any particular idea of the cutoff dates, uh, but certainly uh, someone um, a lot younger than, than, than 16, a, a 10-year-old is writing a little short paper for class, and they want to say that they got some information from Wikipedia that uh, I think we should be just glad that the kid's writing and, and actually <laughs> thinking about giving credit, do credit to people who've helped, uh, and I think that's wonderful. So, um, you know, I think it just depends. Well, talk about the reliability. There was a... a st- a study that was done, of a study of sorts, comparing... Yeah, so there, was, there was a study done, uh, unfortunately, three years ago now, so it's, a, it's quite a bit out of date, uh, comparing articles from Wikipedia and articles from Britannica, and they sent the articles out to experts uh, to ask them how many errors they could find. And what they found was that there were about three errors per article in Britannica and about four errors per article in Wikipedia. So... At that time, we weren't quite as good as Britannica, uh, but within striking distance. And um, what I, I think surprised a lot of people about that particular analysis is that the, um, uh, the, the three errors per article in, in Britannica really opened people's eyes to something that I think <laughs> is really important for people to understand, which yeah. is that um, doing really good quality uh, reference work is really, really hard, and um, we shouldn't be too agitated about there being errors. We should try to make uh, as few errors as possible and never be complacent about it, but at the same time, we have to be realistic and say, we're never going to have a perfect encyclopedia. That's just not within the realm of human possibility. Well, you know, I thought it was, you know, it was obviously an imperfect study. It, it looked at a handful of articles. They may have been cherry-picked for all kinds of reasons. But, and, and in fact, it, it, it was imperfect in the sense, too, that the, um, the, one of the areas, you know, they, they focused on mostly scientific and technical topics correct. where we happen to have a strength. So we would have come out much worse had they, uh, you know, done, done entries that we were very weak on back in, at the time. So unfortunately, that, there, there hasn't been a lot of academic research uh, into the quality of Wikipedia, and uh, I think that's a shame, and I think it's a shame for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, I, I think that uh, most of the research would, would find that Wikipedia's quality is actually pretty decent, um, and uh, that what I think is, is also important is I would love to see research actually helping us to understand better um, where is Wikipedia flawed? Um, where does it tend to have a higher error rate? Where are our weaknesses? Uh, where are our strengths? I think those would be some really valuable things for our community to understand. And also, I just think as a topic of academic research, um, Wikipedia is having an astounding cultural impact all over the world. It's, it's the number three hit in most search engines for most anything you type in. Uh, you know, it's, it's there. People are relying on it for information, uh, and so therefore we, and by we, I don't just mean us at Wikipedia, but we as responsible citizens of the world, um, really ought to think hard about Wikipedia and think about um, how it could be made better and what are its strengths and what are its weaknesses. And I, I just think it's really quite socially important question right now. Well, I think the biggest study that uh – bears out the quality is that number you gave me earlier, 280 million visitors in a month. I'd say it's a pretty good market test that people are getting some value from it. Now, of course, they, sure. could, be, they could be being led down the, a, a path of, of error, but my, I think the, the whole issue of accuracy is the wrong issue. I, I just for fun looked up uh, Milton Friedman's entry on Wikipedia before we had this conversation, uh-huh. and it's Infinitely, it's got an error in it. By the way, I think uh, I'm gonna. I'll suggest that it. It suggests that the phrase "inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon" comes from the monetary history of the United States. I don't think that's where it's from. I think it came from a lecture he gave in India in 1963. But that kind of error, it's not really very important. Uh, it, it could that's get right, you. Yeah. It could get you a bad mark on a, a red mark on a on a research paper in high school, but. The deeper thing that I think is profoundly useful about Wikipedia, which is missing from an encyclopedia, 
is that the encyclopedia has inevitably, the Britannica, the written encyclopedia, Mm -hmm. inevitably has one expert's view of Milton Friedman. If that person is an acolyte of Friedman, it's going to be a fairly praiseworthy article. If it's an antagonist, it might be very insulting. And my experience in reading Britannica about economists has been very disappointing. There's very little – there's facts. The facts are right about where Milton Friedman was born, that he taught at the University of Chicago, that he later went to Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what's important. What's important is a a, a nuanced discussion of why Milton Friedman is an important figure in intellectual history. And for that, I think Wikipedia dwarfs – Britannica on so many on so many areas, and uh, I think that's where where it's important. Yeah, and and I think that's that's exactly right. And I think you know one of the things that I think is surprising about Wikipedia is um, is the neutrality. Um, that the neutrality concept actually works reasonably well. Of course, um, there's always problems, but um, in general, um, you're not going to see an entry about an important figure like Milton Friedman. It's going to be extremely biased in one direction or the other. Now, occasionally this can happen, of course, but in general, um, we do a really good job on that. And it's actually interesting for uh, a lot of people to, to to learn that we actually have a, we have a bigger problem of bias of non neutrality um, on less controversial subjects than we do on more controversial subjects. So Milton Friedman, of course, um, is quite a noteworthy economist who, who held um, quite important positions and had quite an impact on the field and on the public, um, and is controversial to some extent. And so, therefore, we're going to have people who are very interested in his article who either like him or don't like him uh, for a variety of reasons, and the entry is going to end up being pretty good, whereas, you know, for certain fairly obscure topics, um, it, it actually, um, uh, you know, it, it ends up being uh, an, an issue that the only people who care about the topic are fans or people who hate somebody, and that's actually where we have a really uh, much more difficult time. Is that because there aren't enough eyeballs on each side? Yeah, although I don't think it's purely just a number of eyeballs, but yeah, I mean, I think it's something like that, and I, and I think it's, um, um, you know, if. Uh, I always like to give the example, uh, you know, in, in obscure corners of Japanese anime, uh, the only people who are reading or writing those articles are pretty unabashed anime fans, um, and therefore they, they, the entries don't get a very critical eye, um, you know, uh, in, in general. So that they, they tend to be a little bit um, positive, um, which is not particularly harmful, but it's just no, something that I... No, it's wanted. okay. It's all right. I have another example, actually, that I think is, is somewhat interesting, and this is if you if you look at um, you know this is a, this example is a few years old, but it's, I still think it's interesting. I think the problem has been mostly resolved. But so look at two minority uh, religions in the United States, um, which would be um, uh, the Church of Scientology and the Church of Latter Day Saints, so the Mormons. Well, the Scientologists uh, quite famously. Um, have been very litigious over the years. Uh, they had a big lawsuit with people on the Internet for revealing their secrets, and, and they, they have a lot of critics online, but also a lot of supporters online. The entries uh, on topics related to Scientology tend to be very, very good. They're very carefully vetted by people who are supporters, people who are opponents, um, and they, they, they really negotiate a compromise uh, such that the articles are quite good. Whereas um, at one point in time, somebody posted to the mailing list uh, saying, gee, I just was reading uh, some entries about various people who appear in the Book of Mormon, which is the holy text of the the Mormon religion. Uh, And uh, I noticed uh, entries that would say things like, so-and-so was a prophet. Well, so-and-so was a prophet is, of course, a tenet of the religion, but it's not something that um, is neutral. Um, and what happened was almost no one knows what's in the Book of Mormon except for people who are into the Mormon faith. And also Mormons are very, very nice people. Uh, just culturally, uh, every Mormon I've ever met was super friendly, nice people. They don't, they're not very annoying, and they don't get in big fights on the Internet. So the people who were writing those entries were Mormons. They weren't intending to be biased. Uh, they weren't trying to subvert Wikipedia. They just wrote what they knew, and it didn't occur to them 
uh, to, to write it in a slightly different way. So what this person said is, hey, I, I went through these entries and I didn't do enough to really fix it, so I hope more people will look at it, but I just changed them to say things like, uh, you know, according to the Book of Mormon, comma, so-and-so was a prophet, which is a very simple way to... Sure. And of course, the people who were there already writing it, they, they weren't offended by that. They, they said, oh, well, yes, that's exactly correct and not a problem. Um, but that's kind of an example where um, it is sometimes, uh, you know, a, a less controversial subject is is more biased than a more controversial subject. Uh, Clay Shirky, who was a guest on the show a while back, uh, suggested that Wikipedia, uh, at least when he was looking at it, is the product of about uh, 100 million hours of human effort. And that, yes. and that watching TV uh, in America is about a, a 2,000 Wikipedias a year. Um, exactly. Any thoughts on how some of that time might get harnessed for some other projects? Um, well, I think, it's, I think it is happening already in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you know, as people are turning to the Internet and also becoming more um, – uh, involved on the internet. I mean, there's sort of a life cycle of people on the internet. They get on the internet and they're readers at first, but eventually they become participants and, and eventually they may have a blog or post comments or edit Wikipedia or something like this. So I think that we're going to see a lot of this, uh, this idea of um, a lot of, I mean, it's, it's really kind of a staggering amount of, uh, you know, 200 billion hours of television a year. Um, that's a lot of brain cycles that are not really yep. being used very efficiently. Um, although I'm actually a bigger fan of people watching TV than, than most uh, in my position. I don't think it's quite as bad as people make it out to be. But nonetheless, um, it is kind of nice to imagine that, gee, what if we took 1% of that time, uh, mm. 2 billion hours a year, which is 20 Wikipedia's worth, what could we create? And, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. There are some fallacies, though, of course, in doing this because uh, those 100 million hours of human thought come from people who are drawn to an intellectual project. And I know lots and lots of Wikipedians all over the world, and basically we're all a bunch of geeks. Yep. And the people watching TV, uh, well, I don't know who they all are, but I think a fairly significant number of them were probably pretty glad that they're not trying to write an encyclopedia. Yeah, they're less geeky, probably. Less geeky, exactly. Although, you know, it is interesting to think about even, even less geeky people whose interests, uh, you know, I mean... Wikipedia's coverage of uh, certain sports is pretty limited um, m compared to the popularity, anyway, of those sports because geeky people aren't always into sports so much. Um, and so, therefore, um, gee, it's, you know, somebody that just watches sports all the time, it actually would be nice to get them involved if they could just make it, you know, a few edits uh, here and there and, and we got, you know, a few million hours of effort uh, expended on... I'll talk... Um, I'll talk, to my good. I'll talk to my brother, see if I can get him to, to, to hey, tell hey, about it. Exactly. Do, do you think the success of crowdsourced projects like Wikipedia can play a role in opening people's minds about bottom-up economics being maybe better than top-down politics? Well, I do. I do think so. I mean, I think it's really an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thought. Uh, and, and I think there is something very... Um, uh, uplifting and, and interesting about something like Wikipedia. Um, one of the things that I, I, I like to say about, you know, Wikipedia and, and culture, and then I will tie this back to your question about economics, but for a long time we've been thinking about culture as being basically two, two things. Um, on the one hand, we have commercial culture, uh, and by that I, I mean things like pop music, um, uh, you know, movies, television, um, most of television. And uh, commercial culture has produced some really, really amazing and fantastic and wonderful things, things like uh, The Beatles or uh, some really fantastic movies and things like this. Um, and also, of course, has generated a very large quantity of rubbish as well, um, some of it quite popular. But uh, and then we think about the the fine arts culture, and we have come to think of that as being some the kinds of things that uh, need to be in some way subsidized. In other words, they're not going to be paid for by the people who are directly consuming it. Um, they're either paid for by the government or they're paid for by um, wealthy patrons. Uh, you know, so things like the opera or um, art museums and things like this. Um, 
Well, Wikipedia is actually something very different. In fact, the broader wiki movement that's going on on the Internet is something very different. The people who are involved in creating culture there, they're not doing it because they're being subsidized by the government to do it, and they're not doing it because they're thinking they're going to sell a billion copies of a Harry Potter book or something. Uh, they're doing it, it's, it's what I call folk culture. It's a reemergence and a, and a strengthening of the idea of folk culture, of ideas being spread in a very grassroots and decentralized way. And the fact that that can be harnessed in an organized fashion, and, and you know, it's not just uh, a billion random pages on the Internet about every topic in the world, which is what we had in Web 1.0, but it's, um, you know, this project where people are following certain rules and standards and style guidelines, and they're actually able to coordinate their efforts and do that in a voluntary fashion. Um, I think it does tell us a lot about how markets work, even though it's not a market um, system. It's not run by money anyway. Right. Um, uh, and, yeah, I, I hope it opens people's eyes a bit to, um, to that sort of thing. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you a, a, a tough question and uh, close with it. You said earlier that Wikipedia has been a good ride. Uh, it's hard to imagine a better one. If, if you think about a person who desires to contribute to the world, to create an environment where you can get 2.7 million entries of knowledge accessible to 280 million people a month, and that's just the um, – well, the 2.7 million is just the English version. Okay. Uh, that's really quite an extraordinary achievement, and I'm curious – how often you pinch yourself, how often you imagine what you could possibly do next that would be nearly as satisfying. So talk about that emotional part of this ride and then what you're working on now. Well, it's, it's really um, astounding, and, and actually where it hits me the most um, is um, when I'm traveling. So just uh, last week, I was in the Dominican Republic um, and I was touring, uh, they, they're building these community technology centers uh, in some of the poorest areas of the Dominican Republic. And I went and visited one of these, and there were kids there using the Internet. And, um, you know, we asked them if they use Wikipedia, and, of course, they use Wikipedia every day. And these are kids who are living in, in shacks with tin roofs um, and, you know, really have very, very... Um, uh, poor access to knowledge uh, and education, uh, but they're using Wikipedia and they're they're getting access to something. This is amazing to see that. I mean, these kids were out of their minds that they um, you know, that I was there. You know, they all wanted a picture with me and all that. Um, and that's really rewarding to say, wow, you know, we're actually having a, an impact um, on on places that um, we all hope that the internet will bring learning and knowledge uh, down to people in, a, in an effective way. And it's good to see that we're actually doing that. In terms of what I'm working on now uh, at Wikia, which is my new company, um, which I spend a lot of time on, um, we are building the rest of the library, is what we say. So we've got about 12,000 active Wiki communities uh, building um, all kinds of projects, everything from uh, political activism sites, humor sites. Um, we have tons and tons of stuff about video gaming, which is, a, you know, we have a very much a geek um, basis, um, computer savvy geeks uh, like computer games and they like to write about computer games and so we have tons of stuff about that. And so the idea here is to kind of expand this citizen participation collaborative authorship model into as many nooks and crannies as we can to say, well, what are all the things that people might collaborate on and how can we uh, empower that and support that? And, um, well, I'm having great fun doing it. Anything else on the horizon that you can talk about? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, we, we don't, uh, I never develop things in secret. I just sort of randomly do things as I <laughs> find them interesting and fun. I guess the thing we've just launched is a question and answer site, which we're still experimenting with and, and tweaking and, and finding ways of, uh, letting people ask questions and answer questions, uh, in a wiki format. And that's going pretty well. So we're, we're excited about that, but yeah, no, sometimes I joke that, um, you know, my next thing I'm going to do is kill the cell phone carriers because I think they're <laughs> horrible. But <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, I'll just hint at that, and hopefully they'll behave themselves so I don't have to come do that. Well, I have to say one of the most extraordinary things about uh, Wikipedia's contribution is that unlike other founders uh, where there's a succession issue 
and people always would say to the to the founder, "Oh, I hope the successor will 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 keep it going and and follow your path." Uh, there's no path to follow. It's all uh, self sustaining at this point. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, I still do have a certain special role in the community, and we do talk about how I can extricate myself from that over the years. Uh, but, I mean, I think uh, Wikipedia would be fine if I were to vanish the Arbitration Committee of English. Wikipedia would take over that and, and all that. I've actually been joking that, uh, you know how Colonel Sanders of uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken um, was a, a real person and, and was a character in, in the advertising, and then eventually after he passed away, they turned him into a cartoon. So I said, well, this is my destiny future. I'll, I'll be me while I'm here, and then after after I'm gone, they won't really need me, but they'll make a cartoon of me and uh and, put me on the box. <laughs> and you'll wear a white suit and have a goatee or whatever he's yeah, got. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, my guest today has been Jimmy Wales of Wikipedia. Jimmy, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. All right, very good. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.